Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's going to be really quick here. Uh, I have the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, uh, to talk about the latest in the Middle East. So I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Corrine, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to provide a brief report on the Iranian ballistic missile attack against Israel that occurred earlier today. I can take just a few questions because this is an ongoing situation and I need to get back to my desk. Today, Iran launched nearly 200 ballistic missiles towards targets in Israel. The United States military coordinated closely with the Israeli Defense Forces to help defend Israel against this attack. U.S. naval destroyers joined Israeli air defense units in firing interceptors to shoot down inbound missiles. President Biden and Vice President Harris monitored the attack and the response from the White House Situation Room, joined in person and remotely by their national security team. We are still working with the IDF and the authorities in Israel to assess the impact of the attack. But at this time, and I stress at this time, we do not know of any deaths in Israel. We are tracking the reported death of a Palestinian civilian in Jericho in the West Bank. We do not know of any damage to aircraft or strategic military assets in Israel. In short, based on what we know at this point, this attack appears to have been defeated and ineffective. This was first and foremost the result of the professionalism of the IDF, but in no small part because of the skilled work of the U.S. military and meticulous joint planning in anticipation of the attack. We are also aware of reports of a terrorist attack in Jaffa that took the lives of a number of Israeli civilians and wounded several others today. Our condolences go out to the families of the victims and to the family of the Palestinian civilian in Jericho. Obviously, my update here is based on early reports, and we reserve the right to amend and adjust as necessary as we gather more information the word fog of war was invented for a situation like this. This is a fluid situation. We will consult with the Israelis on next steps in terms of the response and uh, how to deal with what Iran has just done. And we will continue to monitor for further threats and attacks from Iran and its proxies. We are particularly focused on protecting U.S. service members in the region. And with that, I'll take just a few questions. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. Uh, is the administration making any preparations to evacuate U.S. citizens from Lebanon or elsewhere in the region? We have been very clear for some time now uh, that U.S. citizens should avail themselves of commercial means to depart Lebanon, given everything that's going on. We have said that from this podium, from multiple podiums, we continue to say that, but we have not uh, begun triggering a non-combatant emergency evacuation, a NEO, um, and do not have an intention to do so at this time. If that changes, we'll let you know. But we continue to reinforce the point. American citizens in Lebanon should follow the guidance from the State Department, which is uh, to find civil, uh, civilian commercial means to depart, because in extremis, we may not be able uh, to get them out safely. Yes. Thanks, Jake. Uh, what is the U.S. view on whether Israel should retaliate, and what is your concern about this leading to a wider escalation of war in the region? We've had some initial discussions with the Israelis in the aftermath of this at the military level and also at the White House to Prime Minister's office level. We'll continue those conversations in the hours ahead. I'm not going to prejudge or get ahead of anything. We want to have some deep consultations with the Israelis, and I'll have more to report to you after we get the opportunity for deeper discussions. And escalation yeah. in the region? Obviously, this is a significant escalation by Iran, a significant event. And it is equally significant that we were able to step up with, with Israel and create a situation in which uh, no one was killed in this attack in Israel, so far as we know at this time. We are now going to look at what the appropriate next steps are to secure, first and foremost, American interests, and then to promote stability to the maximum extent possible as we go forward. Yeah. Back in April, the President's message to Israel was to take the win when the U.S. and Israel were able to intercept the barrage of Iranian missiles. Is he recommending a similar Really limited response this time. I will not, from this podium, uh, share the president's recommendations. Uh, he will have the opportunity to share them directly. We're going to have, as I said, ongoing consultations with the Israelis this afternoon, this evening. It is too early for me to tell you anything publicly in terms of our assessment or in terms of uh, what our expectations are of the Israelis or the advice that we will give them. So will he be speaking to <coughs> Prime Minister Netanyahu today? I don't have anything to announce from this podium, but I can tell you that he is 
tracking this minute by minute. We are very much deeply in touch with the Israelis, and insofar as we have calls to read out, we'll make sure to read them out with you. Just last question, then I'll turn it over. Thank you, Jake. In April, after Iran struck Israel, uh, the, is the U.S. issued a number of sanctions um, as a consequence. This morning, the President said there would be severe consequences if Iran carried out this attack. What are those consequences, and are they more severe than sanctions? Totally legitimate question, and that answer will come based on the conversations and consultations we have with our Israeli counterparts. It's too soon for me to stand before you today and give you an answer. What I can tell you is this. Uh, we are proud of the actions that we've taken alongside Israel to, to protect and defend Israel. We have made clear that there will be consequences, severe consequences for this attack, and we will work with Israel to make that the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Jake. Okay, on to the rest of the, rest of the programming here. Uh, this morning, President Biden was briefed by his Homeland Security Advisor, Liz Sherwood Randall, on the latest impacts of Hurricane Helene. And this afternoon, he will receive an interagency inter briefing on the Hurricane Helene response and recovery efforts. At the President's direction, the Biden-Harris administration continues to use every tool available to get assistance and resources to the communities that need them the most. Yesterday, the president approved a major disaster declaration for Georgia, which will unlock additional assistance to help those recovering. This is in addition to the major disaster declaration swiftly approved by the president following requests from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida as well as requests for emergency assistance across seven states. Tomorrow, the president will travel to Raleigh, North Carolina, where he will visit the State Emergency Operations Center to meet with local officials and also first responders. And the vice president will travel to Augusta, Georgia tomorrow, and will then head to North Carolina in the coming days. As of today, thousands of personnel from across the federal workforce are deployed in supporting state-led Hurricane Helene response efforts across the six affected states, including over 1,200 personnel in North Carolina. Still, there is more work to be done, and the Biden-Harris administration will be there for these communities every step of the way. Now, as you can see, we also have Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. Thank you, Corinne, and uh, good afternoon. Um, before uh, standing at the podium, I was at uh, FEMA's National Operations Center being briefed by our personnel as well as state emergency uh, personnel. I thought it uh, very uh, moving and very telling that North Carolina's uh, emergency management director described Hurricane Helene as catastrophic and noted the fact that numerous towns situated along the river had virtually disappeared, had been completely destroyed. In fact, Hurricane Helene is of a, an historic magnitude. This many states hit this hard. The wind field of the hurricane stretched 350 miles uh, from its center. More than 100 fatalities have been reported. Hundreds and hundreds of homes and businesses destroyed. Our hearts break for those who have lost loved ones, and we pray uh, for the swift um, uh, assistance and rescue of those who are currently uh, missing. We are in different phases of a post-hurricane environment, depending on the state and the location within the state. In some areas, we are still in search and uh, recovery, um, search and rescue operations. In others, uh, we are, in fact, in the response and recovery Phase. I thought I would give you some of the latest statistics based on the briefing that I received. And I should say that these numbers are, as you can all well understand, quite dynamic and fluid. They change minute by minute and hour by hour. But just as devastating as the hurricane has been, uh, the, res the response of federal, state, and local authorities has been extraordinary. We have more than 2,000 federal personnel um, uh, dedicated to this effort. On the ground, we have more than 1,200 urban search, urban search and rescue personnel. FEMA staff deployed over 1,200. Corinne mentioned the major disaster declarations and the emergency declarations previously issued. I should note 
that in the six states most severely impacted, the emergency declarations were issued before uh, the storm hit, and we had thousands of personnel uh, dedicated uh, there. We have delivered um, more than 2.6 million ready-to-eat meals and more than 1 million liters of water. Um, at its peak, there were 5.1 million customers without power. We have reduced that amount, and not just the federal government in support of the state and local authorities, but working very closely with the power companies and the other utilities, we've reduced that number of customers without power by 3.8 million people. And so the, the operation is very, very uh, significantly underway. We are working in support of our state and local partners. This is an all of government, frankly, all of community uh, effort. And with that, I'll take some questions. Um, with regards to how many were unaccounted for yesterday, Liz said about 600 were unaccounted for. Do you have an updated number on that? Mr. We do not have uh, an update, but that work is still underway. And I know, for example, within the Department of Homeland Security, the Coast Guard has recently uh, rescued uh, approximately 21 people through their patrols. And there was also some discussion yesterday on whether resources may have been better prepositioned in other parts of uh, the country. There were many assets in the Big Bend region of Florida, some in North Carolina, but should the government have prepositioned more in the North Carolina area? Well, we actually prepositioned um, our personnel and state and local personnel were prepositioned in all six of the most heavily impacted states. This is a, a an historic uh, hurricane. It reached um, not only uh, industrial areas, but of course, as we also point, poignantly see, uh, rural areas as well. Yeah, thanks, Karine. Uh, Liz, yesterday, in focusing on the, the prepositioning here before the storm, said that the that it was focused on the Big Bend region of Florida. So, what prepositioning was taking place there uh, that wasn't taking place in the uh, North Carolina, Western North Carolina area? Remember that um, the prepositioning of assets to include personnel as well as equipment and the like also depends on the terrain. Uh, and the access points. And so we, we pre-position where we think the impacts are going to be greatest. And uh, we have seen the impacts hit mountainous regions that are inaccessible. We now have roads destroyed. Uh, there is a significant amount of mud. We uh, understand that people are still situated in the mud and therefore we cannot undertake debris removal until we are assured that the search and rescue operation has been completed. We have to be very careful about the lives that still can be saved. But what sorts of things were done in was done in North Carolina before the storm came? Like what was the federal presence there emergency wise? I, I don't have the specific numbers of the personnel uh, already okay. situated, uh, but we can get you that data. Thank you, Thank you Secretary. Um, despite all the uh, proactive uh, things that the federal government did and its response, the sentiment, according to my colleagues on the ground from people, is that the federal government is not doing enough to help. Where are they? Where is the help? What is your message to those people? I would say the following, that we are there and we will continue to be there and we will reach the most difficult um, uh, to access locations. We are relentless in our um, efforts to ensure the safety and security of all. And as Corinne pointed out, we will be there for the long haul as well. And I must, I must pay tribute uh, to the heroic men and women, not only of the Fer Federal Emergency Management Administration, uh, but throughout the federal government and throughout the state and local enterprise. Uh, thank you, Secretary, for talking about uh, electric power. I'm curious about the status of cell phone service as the Associated Press is hearing reports that people are having a tough time using their cell phones, being able to make calls, even reach you. Um, yes. What are you doing, and what is the status of that right now? Um, so, um, in fact, communication has been difficult in, in a number of areas, if, if not impossible. A great deal of infrastructure uh, has um, been demolished. Uh, we are working with the private communications companies as well as uh, the FCC uh, to ensure that we can um, uh, rebuild uh, communication towers. We have, for example, deployed 50 Starlink satellite systems uh, to help with the reconstruction of that infrastructure. 
You mentioned that uh, there are roads that have been destroyed, there are places that are so hard hit that it's hard to get to them right now. Um, can, the President mentioned land bridges yesterday and working with the Defense Department. Can you talk about what the effort is right now to get to some of those hard hit areas and what the timeline is looking like to reach the people that are in need there right now? So this is uh, at the President and Vice President's direction and all of government effort. So it's not only by land, but we have deployed air assets. The Department of Defense has been of extraordinary assistance. I don't recall exactly the number of Army Corps of Engineers that have been deployed. I think it's close to 6,000. So it's an all-of-government effort to reach individuals, not just by land, but by air as well. And how quickly do you anticipate getting to some of those areas that have been cut off because of the roads being As quickly as we can. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, do you have a sense of how much money it's going to cost, A, to do this relief effort, and B, to do the rebuild effort once we get there, and how much of that will be covered by insurance companies, and how much will be covered by the government? So this is a multi-billion dollar undertaking. Um, in terms of the search and rescue and the response, I should note that we already have approved approximately $1.7 million in individual assistance uh, that individuals, million, that individuals will be able to access. I believe it'll be as early as tomorrow. It is a direct deposit uh, into their accounts. But the rebuilding uh, is uh, something that is uh, not for today, but that is going to be extraordinarily co uh, costly and it's going to be a multi year enterprise. Uh, thank you, Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, two questions. First, about the President's decision to go to Raleigh. Uh, do you, can you give us a, a little bit of a breakdown as to why he's going to that uh, location and what he will see and whether or not he'll be able to see any of the harder hit areas in the western part of the state? So, um, the decision of where to go and when to go is a decision that must be calibrated according to the capabilities and needs on the ground. And so the President and the Vice President have been quite deliberate to take those sensitivities into account, to work with state and local authorities and ensure that their visit is constructive and not in any way interfering with the urgency of search and rescue operations and the work underway on the ground. And so they selected the timing and location of their visits accordingly. Uh, the upcoming election, obviously, North Carolina is a very important state. Do you have, and ballots are supposed to be going out in, in the coming days. Do you have any sense of how much impact uh, the hurricane had on the ability to carry out the election and carry it out safely? Well, the state and local uh, authorities are in charge of their respective um, election uh, efforts. Uh, they are have that uh, top of mind, and we are going to be able to make sure, they are going to be able to make sure that people have the ability to exercise their fundamental right to vote. Kevin, last question. Um, one of the issues we're hearing about in North Carolina is not just down power lines, but flooded substations. Do you have a sense of how long it will take to get those back online and what the administration can do to help remedy that? Uh, so the president, as Corinne mentioned, is going to be briefed in, a, in an interagency effort. Secretary Granholm and other representatives of the Department of en Energy are going to be um, there. It is, as am I, of course, it is a multi-phase approach. Not only do we have to bring in some additional infrastructure, but there is going to be damage and the like that it's going to take time and money uh, to replace and reconstruct. Um, precise figures I don't have. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I do want to give some stats, some additional stats, um, so that you all have this. More than 4,500 personnel from across the federal workforce. That's the numbers as of today. Uh, FEMA has shipped 7.1 million meal meals ready to eat, more than 7.5 million liters of water, 150 generators, and over 95,000 tarps, nearly 1,300 urban search and rescue personnel on the ground. The Department of Defense has 30 high water uh, trucks and 22 helicopters. So just wanted to make sure you guys have that. Those are the numbers as they are uh, today, the most accurate. And I just have one more thing at the top, and then we will go to Josh to kick us off. Um, so collective bargaining, as you hear us say uh, many times before, is the best way for workers and companies to reach a fair deal, including one that gives workers the pay and benefits they deserve. 
it's important that both parties come to the table and negotiate in good faith, as we talk about is what we're seeing with the ports situation. Uh, as you saw the president say in his statement uh, earlier today, he has urged USMX to come to the table and present a fair contract to the workers of the ILA that ensures they are paid appropriately in line with their peers. Shippers have made record profits uh, since the pandemic and in some case have seen profits grow in excess of 800% compared to their profits prior to the pandemic. Executive compensation has grown in line with those profits and profits have been returned to shareholders at record rates. It's only fair that workers who put themselves at risk during the pandemic to keep ports open see a meaningful increase in their wages as well. As the president said, dock workers will play an essential role in getting communities the resources they need out of the aftermath of Hurricane Helene. Now, this administration will be monitoring for any price gouging activity that benefits foreign ocean carriers, including those on the USMX board as well. It is time for USMX to negotiate a fair contract with the longshoremen that reflects the substantial contribution they, they've they been making to our economic uh, comeback. And with that, Josh, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Um, we could step back. Yeah. Americans right now are seeing chaos in the Middle East, death and destruction from Helene, and now a port worker strike. And I'm curious for how worried should people be about what seem to be three kind of unraveling issues, and what is President Biden doing in terms of changing his schedule or taking additional steps yeah. to try to reassure them? So look, I think a couple of things here that I would note is that I hope the American people have confidence in this president, someone who has experience, who has been a U.S. Senator, a Vice President, and now President for three and a half years, to get the job done to make sure that he has the American people front and center on everything that he does. It doesn't matter if it's for foreign policy issues, world issues here in the United States, obviously. And you're right, there are three major events, if you will, happening all at the same time. And this is a president that spent a lot of his time in the Situation Room with the Vice President, getting updates, being hands hand hand on hands on on getting updates and and talking to uh, and obviously communicating with the Israeli government on what was going on and how to move forward and really monitoring the situation really uh, and he has been he and his team have been having regular uh, uh, conversation well his team has been ha regular conversations uh, with represent represent representatives as it relates to ILA USMX uh, for the past several days uh, all the way up until yesterday uh, and he's been getting updates on that as well the hurricane uh, you've heard from you've heard and seen uh, obviously updates from us on what the president has been doing having conversations uh, with governors local officials trying to make sure they are getting everything that they need that directing uh, his team to make sure that uh, I just laid out some of the things that are already on the ground, whether it's water, food, uh, generators, assistance that is needed uh, to really uh, deal with the impact, this horrible impact that this hurricane has had. And so this is the job of the president, right? Uh, unfortunately, there are going to be events like this. And this is where you see the leadership of a president show up, uh, direct their team, uh, to do everything that they can on behalf of the American people, be that lead, have that world uh, global leadership, as you see from this president. Uh, and so he has been doing that, not just today, not just the last couple of days, but three and a half years. And I think this should send a message to uh, Americans. It matters. It matters who sits behind that resolute desk. It matters what the leadership looks like. Uh, it matters. And you see that almost every day in this administration. Um, you had mentioned that the vice president is finalizing a trip potentially to North Carolina later. Uh, the yeah. president had mentioned he might go to Florida and Georgia later this week. Is there any more you can give on that? I don't have anything more to share on that. Obviously, our big thing is is always to make sure that uh, we don't take away from uh, from the uh, emergency operations on the ground. Uh, we want to make sure there's it's the right time to go. Uh, the president said he's going. He wants to do it. We're working through it. I don't have a, a date uh, or time at, at this at this moment. Uh, 
but tomorrow he's going to go to Raleigh, North Carolina, as I mentioned. He's going to really uh, thank uh, the uh, frontline workers who have been um, really heroic uh, in the past several days and what they've been able to do. And he's going to also survey the impacted area. Uh, so that's what you'll see from the president. We'll certainly have more to share. He does truly want to go to Florida and Georgia uh, to say thank you directly to frontline workers there, meet people, see folks who have been impacted uh, by this horrible storm, uh, a historic storm, I should say. Uh, and so we'll certainly have more to share. And just a funding question. Last week when Administrator Criswell was here, she had said uh, that the agency had enough money to conduct life-saving measures for this disaster. Days later now, given the scope of the damage and that large number of people still unaccounted for, the Homeland Security Secretary said that there's still search and rescue now operations in many places. Is there still enough money for life-saving measures for this particular disaster? So I would let FEMA speak to that directly. My understanding is I don't think anything has changed from when uh, the FEMA administrator was here just this past Thursday. Uh, but I think what's important to note is we are going to be in touch with state and local officials to ensure that they have everything that they need in this time, in this moment, all the federal assistance, all the federal resources. We are committed to that. Obviously, we had, pre we had presented uh, Congress with a robust uh, um, uh, funding request uh, that did not make it into the CR. We are obviously disappointed by that. And so those, conver those conversations are going to continue. We want to see Congress act. Uh, as we can see, just what we've seen from the past uh, couple of days, it is important to have uh, federal assistance uh, for, for Americans uh, who have lost everything, who have lost everything. Okay, Jeff. Uh, Kareem, briefly back on the topic of the <coughs> Middle East. Yeah. Uh, did the United States have a heads up from Iran that this missile strike was coming? And if so, what channels, uh, through which channels did you receive the heads up? As you know, um, um, we, uh, there are, uh, there are conversations that we have uh, and uh, that are not necessarily, what I, here's what I can say. Um, I'm not going to speak to private diplomatic conversation. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, what I can say is that what you saw today, what you heard from Jake uh, Sullivan, is that uh, we are going to continue to be there uh, for Israel, to defend Israel. They have the right to defend themselves. Uh, what you saw today, uh, what's happening, the developments of what you saw today, uh, and what you heard from the President directing the Department of Defense uh, to make sure that we assist Israel and what we, uh, in the um, uh, in, in the operation that we saw coming from Iran. Uh, we were, we, you heard from us earlier today, you heard from the President, and so we're going to continue to make sure that uh, we are there to defend uh, Israel, uh, and we are committed. As you heard from Jake as well, there will be consequences. This is an ongoing developing situation, uh, and so you will hear more from us. I'm not going to get into, uh, any, into it, any intelligence or any uh, uh, diplomatic conversations that we have from here. Uh, when it comes to the uh, dock workers strike, should Americans be prepared for shortages of goods? So, look, I know that there's been a lot of reporting uh, on that, on the Im impact of the, uh, impact that this will have uh, on the economy. And so, look, what we see and how we see this moving forward uh, as it relates to uh, the economy and, and potential impacts is that uh, we're going to continue closely monitoring uh, the situation. We're going to con uh, the p what this could have potentially on the supply chain impacts, assessing ways to address any concerns if necessary. Uh, and the president and the vice president, as I said at the top as well, are uh, being briefed. Uh, they were briefed on the agency uh, assessments that show limited impacts on critical consumer needs at this time, including in the important areas of fuel, food, and medicine. And so the president has direct directed. Remember, he started the su he started the supply chain disruption task force very early on to deal with what we saw uh, related to the pandemic. And so they're going to meet every day. This task force still exists. They're going to meet every day and prepare to address potential disruptions if necessary. And so we are we are engaged extensively uh, with labor industry, state and local officials, ocean carriers, and rail and truck companies, uh, including multiple meetings with retailers, grocers, manufacturers, and in 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 agriculture. Uh, so this is something, when it comes to the supply chain, as we uh, obviously, as I just mentioned, we started, the president started the task force. We are taking this very seriously, and we're going to monitor uh, this very closely. Thank you, um, yesterday, when the president was asked whether he was aware of a limited ground operation into Lebanon by Israel, he said, I'm more aware than you might know. Can you elaborate on what he meant? 
did the president play a role in determining the size and scope of that ground operation? No. I mean, this is, when it comes to uh, any military operations uh, that, uh, uh, that Israel has IDF, it is for them to speak to, it is, it is for them to um, uh, come to their determination of what that looks like. What we have been very uh, clear about is that Israel has the right to defend itself uh, against Iran-backed groups, including Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis, and we have always been clear about that. Uh, we understand, as I've stated, and I'll give a little bit more today, uh, the, Israelis will, the Israelis will be conducting limited operations to destroy Hezbollah infrastructure that would be used to threaten Israeli citizens, and this is in line with Israel's right to defend itself uh, and, and its citizens and safely return their, their civilians uh, to their homes. So we support that right to, to, to defend themselves against Hezbollah and all, again, all of Iran-backed groups, and we've been very concerned consistent about that and will continue to be so. And then I know there is a lot going on, but will the president sit down and watch the vice presidential debate tonight? Where, with you? <laughs> as you as you just stated, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. I mean, the question that I got from Josh moments ago is there are multiple events happening all at once, and the president is going to continue uh, certainly to deal with all of these events on behalf of the American people. Look, you heard from the president uh, just a couple days ago. He has uh, complete confidence uh, in uh, in Tim Walz. I'm going to be really mindful, you know, because it is a, a campaign event. Uh, I'm just going to leave it there. Is he going to watch? He's going to be uh, very, very busy, con continues to be very busy with all of the events happening today, uh, but he has complete confidence uh, in, the, in Tim Walls. Thank you. Okay. You spoke about wages earlier. Can you talk about the President's view of the ILA's push to put restrictions on automation? That's a major sticking point in those negotiations. Look, what I will say, I'm not going to go point by point with what they're negotiating. We believe, we believe it is important that workers get a, a fair pay uh, and also benefits. That's what they deserve. I just laid out uh, what uh, what the shippers were able to do. Right? They were able uh, to get, uh, they were able to regain their profits. Uh, some of it in excess of 800 uh, percent since the pandemic. Right? Executive compensation has grown in line with those profits, and profits have been returned to shareholders at record rates. And so, you know, uh, ILA, these workers deserve uh, to get paid uh, what they're worth. They deserve that. Uh, they put their lives at risk during, uh, you know, they, they worked, <laughs> uh, you know, they had to work during the pandemic to keep ports open. That was not an easy thing to do. They put themselves at risk, and so now they deserve fair wages. Anything yep. particularly about technology? They're concerned that... No, I hear the question. I'm not going to get into specifics here. What we believe is that they should get their fair, uh, their fair uh, wages and benefits, uh, just like their peers. Uh, and, and so we believe that collective bargaining is the way to go. Both sides need to, to continue to have conversation and do that in, in obviously, uh, in a way that le leads to a way that uh, workers get their fair share. Just a question on tomorrow's travel. Why isn't Harris traveling with Biden since she will be going to North Carolina, as you said, in the coming days? Well, she's going to Georgia. So the president's going to do North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, and she's going to go to Georgia. So I think it's a, it was a way to make sure that uh, we, cover, uh, we cover all fronts. Uh, and then she'll go to North Carolina in upcoming days. So on the Port Strait, um, so with the rebuilding of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, isn't it a, a bad time to have supplies stuck at 36 ports as of right now? So how long then until the president decides he should step in in the strike? So a couple of things. According to FEMA, uh, it, uh, the strike is not impacting uh, the relief of uh, recovery efforts at this time because supplies were prepositioned. You heard, uh, you heard the FEMA administration, administrator mention this uh, just last week. You heard that from, um, uh, from the secretary just moments ago. Uh, so any specifics on that, obviously, uh, I would refer you to them. Uh, look, we have a supply chain, uh, supply chain disruptions task force. Uh, they're going to be monitoring the situation. Uh, this, there's a reason why the president put that together to assess the supply chain. And so they're going to be there to work with any potential uh, disruptions. But I, 
in your in your question to me about when is the president going to be involved, the president's message has been very clear. I just laid that out for one of your colleagues. Uh, we've been very clear when it comes to these types of moments here uh, that labor, uh, when it comes to negotiating, there needs to be uh, collective bargaining is incredibly important. Workers need to get their fair share. Uh, they need to get what they deserve, uh, pay, pay benefits, uh, wages. Uh, it is important that happens. Uh, the president's going to continue to be regularly briefed. Uh, and we are urging USMX uh, to come to the table to present a fair proposal to ILA. So Taft hardly is off the table indefinitely. I've, I've spoken to this. This is not, this, we, we have not used Taft Hartley, and we're not planning to. Uh, one quick one, if I could, on Iran. So Iran, obviously we saw what happened today. They also have an active plot to assassinate one of the candidates in the U.S. election, which could be seen as a direct uh, election interference. Is there any talk of consequences for Iran in terms of limiting their revenue, going <coughs> after their oil exports? So look, you heard... Um, Jake speak to this on what there will be consequences. You heard Jake say this. Uh, this is an ongoing situation. He had to get back to his desk uh, to make sure that he continues to uh, monitor what's happening, occurring, having uh, conversations uh, with uh, with his counterparts as well uh, in Israel. Uh, but this administration uh, has not lifted a single sanction on Iran. We cannot forget that. Uh, rather, we continue to increase pressure. That's what we have seen. Uh, our extensive sanctions on Iran remain in place, and we certainly will continue to enforce them. And you heard from the National Security Advisor. You heard what he said today. But, but oil, Iran's oil exports have reached record levels now. Um, one report showing 3.2 million barrels uh, per day, according to OPEC. That's about 90 billion dollars a year. So when do we cut off that revenue? We have not lifted any a single sanction. If anything, as I said moments ago, we increase pressure. That's what we have been doing. Uh, you'll hear more from us. Jake was very clear when he was here at the podium about consequences. And so I'm going to let uh, I'm going to let that be for now. Okay. Thanks. Six months ago, the vice president was in Los Angeles when Iran conducted its first wave of strikes. And the vice president joined virtually when she joined the national security team for a briefing that day. Today, she's the nominee. She was in the Situation Room. I'm just wondering if you can elaborate at all about what her engagement has been like today and what it will be like in the next uh, 48 hours as Israel plots its response. I mean, you just answered your own question. The, pres the, pres the vice president joined the president today in the Situation Room as they were monitoring the situation, as the president uh, was listening to his team and hearing feedback on what was happening on the ground. She was there. She was uh, alongside him in getting that uh, in getting that uh, update, uh, and she is many times has been uh, in the room or, as you just said, has called in uh, when it's come to really important critical uh, national security issues. And so that has been the way that they have worked together in the past three and a half years, uh, and that's the way it's going to continue as as we work through what's next. Does it make any difference, though, uh, participating virtually versus being here in person today? No, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say there's a difference. The, po the point is she's in the room. She's side by side with the president. Uh, she's getting an update from the national security team uh, and others that is part of his, uh, uh, part of his team on, on these important issues as we talk about foreign policy and what's going on in the world. She's part of it. She's there. She was there for a majority of the time that the president uh, was in the Situation Room today as we were watching uh, what was occurring, uh, and that's going to continue. Okay, okay. Thanks, Doreen. Uh, the president walked the picket line last year with auto workers in Michigan, which is a swing state. Why not walk the picket line here? So look, I, I think the message has been really clear. It really has uh, on what the president wants to see. Uh, we've been very clear about making sure uh, that there is um, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, there is a way that these workers get their uh, get their fair pay, right? Get their wages. Uh, and the president's team has been having these conversations, Secretary Buttigieg and also um, uh, Secretary of the <coughs> Department of Labor uh, and also um, our NSC Director Lail have been having regular c communications and we've made our message really clear on collective bargaining, how important it is and how, uh, how USMX uh, needs to come to the table and present a fair proposal to ILA. Uh, outside of that, I don't have anything else to share, uh, but um, I think, our, I think we've been loud and clear on what we want to see uh, and what we believe the workers deserve. And 
has the administration been as involved in this strike as it was during the UAW strike? So let's not forget that there's been multiple strikes, right, over the last three and a half years, and we've been pretty consistent and pretty steady. Uh, the president has been called uh, the most pro-union president uh, in modern in modern history, if you will. And so we have delivered our message directly to USMX. Uh, we have been very, very clear. Uh, and also the other senior officials that I listed, it's been very clear. We've delivered those message, uh, and we have been in touch with both parties. And so we're going to continue to do that. Uh, and what we want to see is collective bar bargaining in the best way uh, for the workers, to make sure they get their fair pay, uh, to make sure they get the benefits that they deserve. During the pandemic, they did the hard work. They put their lives at risk uh, to make sure that the ports were open. Uh, and let's not forget, these executives uh, have made record profits, record profits. And so these workers deserve uh, an increase as well. And quickly on the Middle yeah. East, if I may, is the U.S., bottom line, is the U.S. urging Israel to measure its response? What I will say is what Jake Sullivan said to you all just moments ago. Uh, we're going to continue the conversations. Uh, we're going to, uh, there will be consequences. Uh, we were, we we're going to continue to be there for Israel, help Israel defend itself. Uh, that, when it comes to Israel security, that continues to be ironclad. Uh, I don't have anything else to share beyond that. Um, just turning back to the strike for a minute, um, I wanted to get a sense. You mentioned um, the president is calls himself the most pro-union president. Not just him. Not just um, him. Yeah, Where union members. Yeah. Um, could you expand a little bit on his relationship with um, Harold Daggett, the head of the union, and also the vice yeah. president's relationship with him? So I don't have anything to to read out on their relationship or private conversations. What I can say is, uh, you have you have heard me say multiple times, his senior officials, White House senior officials, have been in touch with both parties, and we are urging USMX to come to the table, uh, to come to the table with a fair proposal. Uh, we cannot say this enough. We believe that uh, these workers deserve a fair pay, they deserve uh, a benefits, uh, and that, that meets the, the level of their peers. And so that's what we're going to continue to say and have those conversations. You read and saw the President's uh, statement earlier today, and the message is going to be very, very clear here, uh, and those conversations are continuing. I don't have a relationship uh, to speak to. I don't have any, uh, any uh, preview uh, to speak of at this time. Okay. Just, it, uh, can you say that they have actually spoken to each other, though? I know. I'm saying I don't have anything to read that. out. I, I don't have anything for you at this time. Okay. And then just sort of related to that, um, you, you sort of made a very clear point that the, in the sort of immediate days here, there are many experts say there is isn't an immediate impact that consumers will feel. But that, as you know, um, Harold Daggett has pointed out himself, after one week, two weeks, three weeks, um, that dynamic would change significantly. And is, can you say anything about how long the president is willing to wait? So, look, a couple of things. We're going to closely monitor the situation. You heard me talk about the, the supply chain task force. I do want to lay out uh, a number of our agencies. They put out assessment that showed limited impact on critical consumers' uh, needs at this time. So on energy, for example, from the Department of Energy, the strike will not have any immediate impact on fuel supplies or prices. On food, from the Department of Agriculture, we should not expect a, a significant changes to food prices or availability in the near term on medicine from the Department of Health and Human Services, immediate impacts across medicines, medical devices, and infant formula for consumers, parents, and caregivers should be limited. But of course, we're going to closely monitor this uh, and uh, any for any potential uh, supply chain impacts. Look, and we have this task force. Uh, this task force came into play, obviously, during the pandemic uh, to deal with this situation that we were dealing with because of a once in a century uh, pandemic. And so they're gonna monitor it very closely. Uh, and so uh, we're, you know, what we're gonna continue to do is be very clear on our message to USMX. Uh, they gotta come forward uh, with a fair proposal uh, that is fair to the, to the workers. And so that is our message. And they are hearing that from senior officials uh, from the White House. question regarding Africa. Uh, for Angola, President Biden is traveling to Angola, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. Uh, could you provide, there are 54 countries mm -hmm. on the continent, and 
I, as well as other leaders from the administration have traveled over there. What is your message to other African nations, uh, as well as the African Union? I would say that the president traveling to the continent sends a positive message to other nations. I know you're asking me about other countries, but the president's I'm going. No, but, but the president's going to the continent. I think wait, to wait, wait, but the president, and you just mentioned too in your question that other uh, other officials have gone to other countries in the continent, right? And so, if anything, you have seen. Uh, our commitment uh, to building on that relationship uh, with, the, with those countries in the continent. Uh, as it relates to uh, Angola, he's going to have bilateral meetings there. He's going to have multilateral meetings as well uh, to discuss increased collaboration on shared priorities. And let's not forget uh, uh, the PGI, uh, what this, an initiative that this president started. Uh, that's going to be the, uh, Africa's first transcontinental open access rail network. Uh, that's going to start there. So I think if you think about it, what the president has done this past three and a half years, going to Angola, uh, is a connecting, uh, a connecting factor in some of in this key initiative, the PGI. Right? We're talking about uh, a, a historic effort uh, in this open access rail network, uh, and so that's going to be a big deal for everyone, every country uh, in the continent. And so, if anything, this shows the president's commitment. Uh, and he said he was going to go. Uh, he's keeping that commitment. But it's not just that. He wants to make sure that we're advancing uh, cooperation uh, with the continent when it comes to the economy, right? when it comes to technology. Uh, and so that's what you're going to see from this president. Uh, my other question is, today is uh, Nigeria's Independence Day. Uh, do you guys have any remarks or any statements? Uh, I will talk to the National Security Council. I don't have anything to share uh, with you at this time. Okay, all right. Go ahead. Back in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> ahead of tonight's debate between um, J.D. Vance and Tim Walls, there are reports that VA staffers have accessed their medical records at the VA. Would you say that one more time? I, I missed that. That's okay. Um, there are reports that VA staffers have accessed okay. the medical records of J.D. Vance and Tim Walls, you know, as there's <laughs> rising interest in them um, as part of the election. Is that Wait, acceptable? The, there are medical records that were ask, accessed? By VA on, on their medical records of, um, when they were of JD Vance and Tim Walls. Okay. Is that acceptable for this? I, I, this is the first I'm hearing about this, so I have to get some more information on that. I this is the literally the first time I'm hearing uh, about this. Uh, so let me get back to you because um, I need to get the full context of that question. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.